appreciate Rebecca and Matthew and their musical ability this week. Tonight, <clears throat> they're going to do a piano. Is that a duet? Is that right? On the piano? They'd do a duo if we had two pianos, but uh, they're going to do a duet on the piano tonight. Don't miss that, all right? And uh, Matthew's here. He's going to sing for us, and then after he sings, Brother Booth will come and bring us the message for the morning, all right? Brother Matthew. My nature is a mire beneath my footsteps. My heart is but the source of all my pride. O God of power and grace, I fall before your face. In mercy grant this wretched soul a heart that you'd revive. Revive my heart, revive my heart. I have longed for Egypt and been given a wilderness. Revive my heart, revive my heart. That I rejoice in you, O Lord, revive my heart. I'm overwhelmed how such a holy father would stoop to lift one up so small, so weak. With self-denying gaze, I repent of all my ways. Unworthy of your pity, Lord, forgiveness now I see. Revive my heart, revive my heart. I have longed for Egypt and been given a wilderness. Revive my heart, revive my heart. That I rejoice in you, O Lord, revive my heart. Revive my heart. Wonderful music. I've enjoyed it. And uh, preacher, what time do I need to stop? Huh? Okay. Uh, you don't want to tell an evangelist that. That's that's dangerous. Dangerous. Looking forward to tonight. Looking forward to the piano special. And uh, maybe if there's time, you could work in uh, Brother Fennel doing his interpretive dance he talked about. <laughs> I've been, been looking forward to that, brother. <laughs> Your wife's over there praying, Dear Lord, no, please. Uh, I have enjoyed this week. I have enjoyed our missionaries and I thank God for folks whose hearts are just said, Lord, show me where you want me, and we're willing to go, and uh, just been a blessing. I've enjoyed the fellowship with, uh, with the church folks, and you have been beyond kind and generous to us, and I know I speak for every missionary. Last night was overwhelming, and the thoughtfulness, and each night gifts that were been given to us, and we're just very, very appreciative. I um, last night, uh, I've been given three, I'm wearing one of the ties, I've been given three ties, two of them I like. <laughs> and uh, you may see one tonight, I don't know, I just see how the Lord leads, but uh, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I went out this morning to get my car, and uh, man, somebody took it, washed it, and uh, filled it with gas, and uh, I just, we, we're so grateful uh, for the kindness and love and uh, shown to us and so thankful my wife was able to come with me and uh, I always say, you know, um, 
people like me better when my wife is with me. And uh, so all the years I've come before, you've never been kind to me. But finally, I brought my wife, and you've been, you've been nice. But, uh, but praise the Lord. I'm glad to see you this morning. I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Most all of us are familiar with the story of Jonah, but I just want us to glean a couple of lessons. Jonah was a missionary, but he was a rebellious missionary. But there's some tremendous lessons that uh, we find in this wonderful account of Jonah's effort as he went to Nineveh. Jonah chapter 1. For those who've not been able to be here through the week, or you chose not to be here through the week, I sure want, want to encourage you to really be seriously praying about giving to Faith Promise Missions. It is one of the greatest opportunities and blessings of the Christian life. And I think one of the things that God blesses as much as anything we, that we're involved in, because it's really the heart of God, and I think you'll see some of that this morning. And the truth is, everybody can do something. And that's all the Lord's asking, is that we find what He wants us to do individually. And everybody can do something. I'd be embarrassed to call myself a follower of Jesus Christ and not offer something. And so all of us can do something. And uh, on that card, of course, you've got a lot of different choices. Everybody could do something. Children, most children could do something. In fact, it'd be good for parents to give your children a little bit to put into missions every week and uh, get them in the habit uh, of uh, enjoying giving to missions. But here in Jonah chapter 1, let's begin reading with verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them to, unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So you can see Jonah was given a command. He was given an assignment from the Lord to go to Nineveh, but he's running from God, and instead he gets on a ship. It says in verse 4, it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man uh, unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God would think upon us that we perish not. And they came uh, uh, and they said every one to his fellow, Come. And let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said, said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? And what is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as, as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, 
and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now I want you to see, folks, that this is not just a fairy tale. This is a true account of a man who ran from God and God had a purpose and a plan for him to fulfill. And God had called him to go to the city of Nineveh. Its sin was great before God. And God was sending his man, a prophet of God, to preach against their sin. Let me just say this. It's not really part of the service, but man, we need a revival of preachers who will preach against sin again. I'm going to tell you, we'll never see any hope for America, just as your preacher said. It's not about getting uh, five steps of how to overcome some kind of uh, a sin addiction. It's about getting a changed heart. And nobody's heart changes till we're confronted with the sinfulness of our own flesh. And a repentance takes place in the heart. And that's what God called Jonah to do. He called him as a missionary to go to this, this uh, city of Nineveh. And, and uh, the Ninevites are what we know today as ISIS. They really are. That's who they were. And they were wicked back then, and they had no mercy on people back then. In fact, the Ninevites of that day were known for pleasure to take their, the, the, if they conquered an enemy, they would take their captives, they would put them in public, string them up, and, and fillet them alive, peel their skin off until they died, and it was an entertainment for them to watch the torture that took place. It's similar to what we hear going about sometimes today. They were wicked people, vile people. I can comprehend why Jonah didn't want to go. These were vile people, but God called Jonah, and Jonah refused to go, and so... We, we read the story how that when they finally cast him over the ship that, that God had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in that fish's belly three days and three nights. The truth is it was a death sentence. Jonah would have died had God had not intervened and heard Jonah's cry and he delivered Jonah from that fish's belly. And when Jonah came out, he decided he'd go to Nineveh. God gave him another chance, and he went to fulfill what God had called him to do. And so he went to Nineveh. It tells us in chapter 4, as Jonah preached to Nineveh, the Bible tells us he preached repentance, and great revival came to everybody, to that entire city they turned to God. In chapter 4, and verse 1, it says, But it dis displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. God, uh, Jonah really didn't want him to repent. He was a sorry missionary, wasn't he? I mean, he was angry that they repented. He wanted them to have to pay for their sin. And yet God forgave him. And notice what he says in verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled bef uh, before into Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Jonah said, I knew that you'd be merciful, God. I just knew that if I went and preached to those bunch of wicked people, they hate us, uh, us Hebrews. I knew that if I went and preached to them, it'd be just like you, that they'd repent and you'd forgive them. I mean, what a missionary, huh? What a story. Real revival took place when Jonah went. Chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. A couple of things I want us to pick up on tonight, I'm not, or this morning. I'm not sure I'll get through the whole message, but we'll go as long as the Lord wants us to. I promise you, I won't keep you too long. As Brother Slaybaugh said, we've got food waiting, Amen. But some lessons I want you to see. First of all, God's pity. I want you to see God's pity on these wicked people. The mercy of God is overwhelming. I mean, folks, to think that God would send somebody to these wicked people as cruel and vicious and vile as they were, 
And yet the God of heaven wanted them to be saved. Don't you know that he wants them to be saved in that 1040 window? Don't you know that he wants them to be saved in Kenya? Don't you know that he wants them to get Bibles in their own language so that they can understand the truth? Don't you know that if God was willing to send somebody as rebellious as Jonah was to, to, to Nineveh and do a work in the hearts of those wicked people that God wants to do that across the world? Don't you know that if you're saved this morning that he has done that in your heart? Don't you want others to be able to have that experience, to know the amazing mercy of our God? And thank God he's merciful. And here the Bible tells us when, when Jonah went there in, in chapter uh, 3 and verse 4, it says, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Still, as Jonah entered into the city, God was willing to give them forty days, forty more days to repent. It's always the character of God to be gracious, to be merciful, to be kind, to be slow to anger. And sometimes we who are saved have forgotten that it took as much of the mercy and grace of God to reach down and save us as it did for those wicked people in Nineveh. And sometimes we forget, we look on the news and we see the ISIS people beheading somebody and boy, it stirs our anger and we look at those people. But I want to tell you something, they have a soul just like you and I do. And they're made of the same old wicked flesh that you and I are made of. And it takes the grace of God to save you and me as much as it does to save them. And God was merciful and God was gracious. I love that song that sometimes we sing. Let me see this world, dear Lord, as though I was looking through your eyes. I'm going to tell you if every single one of us sitting here this morning that's a born-again believing Christian, if every one of us were able to see through the eyes of God this morning, I guarantee you there wouldn't be a one of you that'd hesitate to give to missions. Lamentations, it tells us in chapter 3 and verse 22 and 23, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are, are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The mercy of God. Do you know that same mercy that reached down sent somebody to tell you how to be saved? Is the same mercy that wants us to give so that these missionaries could get to the field to others who have no hope. I was challenged a few years ago. A guy told me, he said, Brother Booth, have you ever read the book Peace Child? I said, no, I've never read it. He said, man, you need to get that and read it. He said, read that book. Don Richardson is an, an independent Baptist, but he had a heart that followed the Lord, and God sent him. And they went into, it was called Netherlands, New Guinea, or Erie and Jaya, I think, and it was a place of, of New Guinea, by Papua New Guinea. And, and God gave him a burden to go up there and reach people that nobody had ever gone to. They had never seen a white man. The story is incredible. And as he went up the river... The first time that he went, he took some, some fishing line because he wanted to have something to offer them to show them that he was not an enemy, but he was coming to try to be a, a friend. And he thought, well, they can use fishing line. So he took some fishing line and I think maybe a, a hatchet or a hammer or something like that that he could, could give to them that they could use in their daily work. And he got up and when he got to this, this, this shore in this one area, uh, there was an entire tribe that was waiting along the shore with spears already drawn. They were headhunters, cannibals. They'd never seen a white man. They're, they would have about, oh, a quarter of a mile or half a mile away would be another uh, tribe. Another quarter mile or so would be another tribe. They all hated each other. Their whole lives were fighting each other. And as Don Richardson pulled up and they had their spears drawn, he showed them his hands that he had no weapons. 
And they lowered their spears and they looked at him. He was a white man. They'd never seen a white man. And he offered them some fishing line. And, and they accepted that. And they were very curious. And out of their curiosity, they just decided to let him hang around a little bit. But he didn't know their language. He, they had no written language. And so he began to try to listen and understand sounds. And he began to try to figure out a way to develop a language that he could be able to speak to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. They were in such conflict all the time with these other tribes. It was like a, every other day they were, they were fighting and, and, and killing each other. And said it was just awful. And finally he, he was there for long enough that he built a little shack or something that he was staying in. And he, he had enough communication that he figured out how to begin to speak to them a little bit. Little by little, he was able to communicate. Finally, he, he was able that he thought, man, I, could, I can begin to tell them the story of God's love for them. He gathered all the men together because they never had the meeting where the men and the women would meet together at the same time. So he gathered all the men together and he began to tell them how that God had created man and man had sinned, but God so loved them that he sent His Son to come on this earth. In their minds, in their hearts, in their culture, the hero of any story was the, the villain. In their minds, if you, could, if you could trick somebody, take advantage of them, you were the hero. And so he was telling his story. When he got to the part about Judas Iscariot betraying the Lord Jesus, they stood up and began to cheer for Judas. It's how messed up their thinking was. He got so irritated and so frustrated he couldn't get through to them. And the next morning there was another big fight and they're killing each other and he finally decided I'm packing up and leaving. I can't get through to these people. One of the men came to him and said, where are you going? He said, well, he said I, can't, I can't help you people. I'm moving on. The guy said, no, don't, don't move on yet. He said, well, all you want to do is kill your neighbors all the time. He said, I, I can't deal with it. He said, well, he, he, said, uh, I, uh, he said, let me help you a little bit with our culture. He said, we don't understand about this, this Jesus coming and being sacrificed for us. But he said, I'll tell you what, in our cult culture, what we have is if we want to make peace with a, a neighboring tribe, we take one of our newborn children. We offer it to that tribe. As long as that child is alive, that tribe will keep peace with us. But we understand that what that tribe will do is that tribe will take our newborn child and they will kill the child and they'll eat him. And in that, they feel like the child is with them through the rest of their life. He said, we call it a peace child. And he clicked, the missionary said, okay. He gathered them together and he said, let me tell you about God's peace, child. <clears throat> but those people were so messed up in their thinking, so corrupt in their thinking. I'm reading that book and I'm thinking, dear God, how can anybody think this way? And then it was like the Lord thumped me on the head. He does that every once in a while. And he said, you know what, Booth? That's exactly what you would be. Had you grown up in that same area without all of the gracious, merciful things that God allowed in your life, you'd be just like them. And I want to tell you something. We can look at a Jeffrey Dahmer's and we can look at those mass murders and say, how pathetic, but I'm going to tell you something. They're not a bit more pathetic than you and I. You see, there is no sin nature that God is pleased with. Nobody here has a better sin nature than anybody else. It takes the amazing grace and mercy of God Almighty to save any of us. God was so merciful, he looked at those wicked people in Nineveh. And he said, Jonah, you need to go preach to them. And God sent a great revival. The mercy of God. I want you to see our purpose. As we see in this story, Jonah had a purpose. Jonah fought against that purpose. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of independent Baptists sitting around in church fighting the very purpose that God has us here. 
Because, because you see, every one of us that are saved, we are here to be missionaries. Not all of us are going to go to a foreign field, but all of us are to spread the gospel. And he told in, in chapter 3 and verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. We see every one of us who are saved in this time in which we live are supposed to go preach to somebody. You may not preach to a congregation, but you're to preach to a friend, you're to preach to a neighbor, you're to preach to somebody you're related to that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 28 with me. Verse 19. The Lord told him before he was to ascend to heaven, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Go over to Mark chapter 16. Look at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look at Acts chapter 1. In verse 8 he said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Look at chapter 8 of the book of Acts. And here Stephen was martyred, he was stoned to death. Saul, who became the apostle Paul later, Saul was part of that. It says in verse 1, Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The church people were all scattered because of persecution, folks notice, but not the apostles, not the preachers. Verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Notice verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad. Who was scattered abroad? It was the church people. It wasn't, it wasn't the preachers. The church folks that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. You see, that's God's purpose for us. Folks, you can't be right with the Lord without being a missionary. As a Christian, it's our purpose, every one of us, to give the gospel out and to help send those who can get the gospel where we won't go. It's our purpose here. Somebody said, if you're not fishing, you're not following. Because the Lord said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's what we're here to do. We're not here to make friends. We're not here to be famous. We're not here for comfort. We're not here for ease. We're not here for prosperity and pleasure. Our focus is to be souls. That's what this church is to be burdened about. That's what the members of this church are to be burdened about. Souls that are lost, that have no hope. Listen to me, it's no wonder the world acts like a bunch of freaks. They have no hope. They want to talk like a freak. They want to look like a freak. They want to act like a freak. Why? They have no hope. But when you trust Jesus as your Savior and you become part of His family, man, you've got a whole different purpose in life. Now you're an ambassador for Him. Now you get to represent the Lord, letting folks know, hey, there is hope. You can be saved. You can be forgiven of sin. You don't have to carry that guilt around with you all the time. You don't have to live bitter and angry and hate everybody. You don't have to be filled with shame all the time. You're all, there's hope. Our focus is to be souls. Beneath the snow-covered trees behind Andover Seminary in Massachusetts in 1810, Adoniram Judson said, the command of Christ to go into all the world came to my mind with such force and clarity that I knew I must obey the command at all cost. At a cobbler's bench in England, William Carey was overtaken and overpowered with the thought 
of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. In a dorm room at Wheaton College in 1940s, Jim Elliott wrote, Those generations passing away at this moment, they must hear of the Savior. How can we wait? O Lord of harvest, do send forth laborers. Hear my Lord, send me. I carry in my Bible something I tore out of a, I believe it was a BIMI magazine a number of years ago. It so challenged me and convicted me, I just, just keep it in my Bible. And it talks about this lady, Marjorie Browning, She's a single lady, up in years. She left her home. She went to a place called Two Brothers Swamp in Brazil as a single older lady. The one who wrote the article about her said she lives in a very modest home. In the front of the home, there's a small auditorium where she teaches the children. A pastor will come once a month for the service. A solar panel on the roof charges a 12-volt battery. This will give a few hours of light at night. Her refrigerator is powered by a small butane tank. The daily water supply is carried from a nearby river, and drinking water is strained, and, and drinking water strained through a filter. The shower is a plastic one-gallon can with a self-adjusting shower head hung from the rafter. We learned how to take a quick cold shower. We slept well at night with an occasional bat flying over our heads. Some days, she'll walk a long way in deep sand and ford river crossings. In order to reach the people with the gospel, other days she'll ride a horse eight or nine hours to carry out her ministry. She's been over there for 42 years. Never once did I hear Marjorie complain. She will tell you it's the life God called her to. It was not a sacrifice, but a privilege and an opportunity for her to serve the Lord. When God called her to Two Brothers Swamp, some said, you should not go, it's too hard. Her reply was, I'll go because no one else will. She's near 80. She just understood, this is what we're here to do. This is what we're here for. Kind of convicts us when we're too busy to even show up to church on Sunday night, isn't it? We could drive in an air-conditioned car to be at the missions conference, but just kind of other things are more important to us. Ah, oh, we've got excuses. I, I know. I pastored for enough years. I know excuses. But folks, when we get down to the reality of it, people going to hell for an eternity, and there are some that are willing to go to places we'll never get a chance to go to, and we can help send them there, why in the world wouldn't you want to be a part of that? We see from Jonah's story the amazing mercy and grace of God. We see our responsibility isn't any different than Jonah's to get the gospel out. We also see Jonah's problem. I mean, Jonah was, you know, when God's anger stopped, Jonah's began. I mean, Jonah had received mercy from God, but he didn't want the others to get mercy from God. You see, Jonah's real struggle to begin with was Jonah. His real problem was self. His real problem, he was self-driven, he had his own ideas, he could justify everything. He didn't want to leave his comfort zone. His eyes were on self. That always produces pride or discouragement, one of the two. Selfishness. You know, one of the amazing things, if you'll go with me real quick to Philippians chapter 4. We talked one night here about the amazing churches of Macedonia that gave out of great poverty. 
I mean, they weren't people. Here they were an example church in the matter of giving, but it wasn't because everybody could afford it. It says they gave not to their power, but beyond their power. But now look at Philippians chapter 4. We have a wonderful promise in Philippians chapter 4. In verse 19 it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to, your, to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Man, isn't that a great promise? But the promise is written to these Philippians. It was a Macedonian church. That's where Philippi was. It was one of these churches that didn't have a whole lot. And here's the promise given to them. And if you go back to verse 14, it says, Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. This church said, man, look what happened to us when Paul came here. And he was so, God was so gracious to give us the gospel. And we understood about Jesus dying for us. And we got saved. And grandpa and grandma got saved. Mom and daddy got saved. Hey, our cousins got saved. Hey, we started a church here. Man, now Paul's going to another city. He's going to do the same thing. Boy, we want them to have that privilege too. We want them to be able to hear about Jesus too. Hey, let's, let's give to him. And they sent once and again unto Paul. It's called faith promise giving. And you know what the Lord said in return for that? But my God will supply all your need. You that were willing to sacrifice out of your great poverty and give so that Paul could continue his missionary efforts, I guarantee I'll supply all your need according to the riches of heaven. All of God's riches. He promises. What a great opportunity. See, Jonah's problem was he was selfish. It's all about Jonah. And we in America, our biggest challenge is we've been so blessed, we're selfish. I mean, really. You know what? How, you know how many native pastors in countries around the world could live on $100 a month? They're all over. A hundred dollars a month. You know, the truth is, most of us sitting here could afford to give up McDonald's and Burger King enough times that we'd come up with a hundred a month. Pastor's joking about somebody, if you're going to write a check for 500 a week. I know Christians who give 500 a week to missions. That's not out of the realm. We've just gotten our mindset. We're so concerned about our own comfort level, about our own excuses. We're not much different than Jonah. Send somebody, oh man, glad they're going. Well really, are you glad enough that you'll make a little sacrifice that they could go? I was in a missions conference last year and I'd never met these people. A lot of folks have supported them. Bob and Mary Johnston missionaries to the Dominican, they're right on the line of the Dominican Republic in Haiti. I'd never met them before. Amazing story. Bob and Mary Johnston's been on the field for many, many years when, when they went there and began the ministry there. It was just after a short time they'd started several churches. At this time, Bob... At our time, Bob has, had, had, has started 26 churches over there. There was a time that the Dominican men came and at gunpoint took his wife and they made Bob go with them. And at gunpoint made that missionary stand there while his wife was attacked by those men. He felt for just sake of his family that they needed to leave and come back to the United States for a little bit to just kind of recover. They did. They came back on furlough and they spent, I don't think, much more than a year, a year and a half. They recovered. They went back to that same place. 
to win those people to Christ. 26 churches have started. After that event, he had a boy who was, as a teenager was riding a motorcycle. His son flipped that motorcycle and he ended up being a quadriplegic. They kept serving faithfully. They were home on furlough just about a year and a half ago. Bob and Mary were in a truck together and got hit by a semi. Turned them over. Mary was caught in the seat belt hanging upside down. Bob was crushed by the car. And she watched her husband die. I was in this missions conference. I'd not, I'd not known them. The church there had supported them for some time. They had Mary come in to give a testimony at the missions conference. She stood up with such poise and grace and told how good God had been. I felt like I shouldn't even preach after that. I felt like I ought to take my shoes off. I was on the holy ground. She talked about how God had blessed them so much and given them the privilege to carry His Word to those people. She said, God had been good to give us 26 churches, but she said, you know, shortly before the accident when Bob went to be with the Lord, he said to me, honey, I'm worried that maybe I didn't train those Dominican men well enough that they would keep the, the, the work going if something was to happen to me. She said, well, at this point, this was at the mission conference, she said, at this point, I'm glad to report to you that it's been eight or nine months now since Bob's been in heaven, but those Dominican men have started four more churches. You suppose, Christian in America, that we could make a little sacrifice? You got people willing to give up all that to get the gospel? You think maybe there's something more than our next entertainment? You think maybe that getting the gospel over to the world is maybe a little more important than having cable TV? I mean, we talk about Christianity. It talks cheap, isn't it? What are we doing? You see, that's our purpose. The problem is not that there's not enough resources to get the gospel across the world. I guarantee you the Lord didn't give us a command that couldn't be done. The resources are available. We're just like Jonah. We're just too wrapped up in ourselves. I know I'm ruining Sunday morning for you. But I get a little weary. We could sit and laugh in church while the sermon's going on and play around and lights. Oh, yeah, another sermon. We can't, well, let's see what time it is. About over. Do we have Bible Christianity or not? A merciful God willing to save those who are lost in Columbus and across the world. And those of us that are saved, He left us here so we could get the job done. It's really what Missions Conference is all about. Pushing that reset button and saying, let's get our priorities right and let's get this job done. Friars Lane Baptist Church in Nottingham in 1792, Andrew Fuller cried, India is a vast gold mine with no one to venture into its depths. William Carey stood up, leaped up, said, I'll go into that mine, but you must hold the ropes. So my challenge is, let's ask God what He wants us to do in our part, holding those ropes. Let's bow our heads for Our Lord, we love you. Amazed, God, that you would love somebody like us. But so thankful. And Lord, there's a whole lot of other somebodies like us all across this world, across this city. Help us, Lord, to get real about our Christianity and our relationship with thee. And help us, Lord, to be willing to 
be obedient to the part you want us to have. Maybe there's somebody here, Lord, that's sitting here this morning. The truth is they've never even been born again. They're not sure if they died, they'd go to heaven. They don't even understand what all this is about, Lord. That the truth is they've never trusted Christ as their Savior. Would you draw that heart to come to Jesus this morning? And then, Father, I pray that you'd help those of us who are saved. That we might get our priorities where you want them to be. Where, Lord, we had allowed what's important to you to be what's important to us. So bless this invitation, I pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and nobody looking. I want to ask you this morning, can you say, Brother Booth, thank God I'm saved. I, I remember, Brother Booth, where I was when, man, I knew I was a sinner on my way to hell. I knew I deserved it. Somebody was kind enough to take the Word of God and show me from the Word of God how to trust Jesus as my Savior. And with a repentant heart, I called on the Lord. I asked Him to forgive me and save me. If I died right this minute, I know without a doubt that I'd spend eternity in heaven. I trusted Christ as my Savior. If that's your honest testimony, would you indicate that by raising your hand? Just raise it up and put it down and be honest about it. Thank you. I wonder how many would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven, but I needed that this morning. And I can see, Brother Booth, where I've allowed excuses. I've allowed some, some things to clutter my life. I've gotten, I've gotten off track. There's some priorities that need to be put back into place. Truth is, Brother Booth, I'm a member of the church and I don't even give to missions. I haven't been to the missions conference. Brother Booth, the Lord spoke to my heart. I just see this clearly this morning, Brother Booth. There's more to me being here than just my own needs and my own purpose and my own pleasures. I just need to surrender myself afresh and new to the Lord. There's priorities that need to be changed. There's things in my life that are displeasing to Him. But somewhere during the message, as a Christian, the Holy Ghost knew I needed it and He's speaking to my heart about some things. Pray for me as a Christian. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God spoke to your heart this morning. God bless you. Thank God for your tender hearts. Thank God for you. You may put your hands down. Maybe there's others. Maybe something I never even mentioned specifically, but the Lord's speaking to you about specifically. You say, Brother Booth, I didn't raise my hand before, but God is dealing with me. Include me in the prayer. He's dealing with my heart as well. Pray for me. God bless you. I see other hands. God bless you. Glad we waited. Maybe there's some this morning that ought to just come to the altar and say, Dear God, I haven't even prayed about what I should do about faith promise giving. And yet this morning I see how important it is, Lord, and I, I want you to help me, Lord. I need to know what your will is about it. Maybe you ought to just come to an altar and pray about that. I wonder if there's someone who would say, To be honest with you, if I died right this minute, I can't tell you I'm sure I'd go to heaven. I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to go to hell. If I could know for sure according to the Bible that I was forgiven of my sin and saved and on my way to heaven forever, I'd sure like to know that. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Just put it up and put it down. God bless you. God bless you. Somebody else. I'm just not sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. Listen, there's a God that loves you far more than this preacher could ever tell you. He did all the hard part. Sacrificed His own Son to pay for our sin if we just accept Him, trust Him. You're not sure you're saved this morning? Don't hesitate. When others come at the invitation, you come and you let the preacher know, I want to be sure I'm saved. It's not a matter of just going through motions or saying some words... It's not about joining the church, being baptized, putting money in an offering plate. It's about letting somebody show you from the Bible that if you would trust Jesus that died for you, you could call upon Him with a sincere, repentant heart. And He says He will save you and He will forgive you. And that will be settled forever. It's the best decision you could ever make. I want you to stand with me for prayer. After I pray, the music will begin to play. God spoke to your heart. Let's not hesitate. Let's find a place at the altar or if you need to be saved, you let the preacher know, somebody know when you come forward. We'll show you from the Bible how to get that settled. Father, bless now the invitation. Thank you for the time we've had. Thank you for hearts. 
that are tender and a lot of hands were raised. Pray you'd help us to be humble enough to come to an old-fashioned altar. Confess what you've dealt with our hearts about. Receive the grace you want us to have. To have victory for thee. I pray, Lord, that you would please help those that are here, Lord. Raise their hand, not sure they're saved. May it may be others that should have raised their hand that didn't. That, God, you'd speak to their hearts and give them the courage to just step out. And come down and let us know that they want to be sure they're saved, forgiven, and on their way to heaven. So we can show them from your precious word how they could be saved this morning. Do your work, we pray, in Jesus' name. As the music plays, God spoke to your heart. You come, would you? Let's not hesitate. Folks have already come. You need to join them. Come on. Have you prayed about what God's part is for you in this missions conference and this faith promise giving? Have you said, Lord, it's not what I want, it's what you want? Are the priorities in your life pleasing to the Lord? If you were to stand before the Lord, is everything okay this morning? The Lord did some pretty severe things to wake up Jonah. We could have gone on and talked about that. Are you serious about being a Christian? about following the Lord Jesus Christ are you a soul winner you need to come you come you're not sure you're saved please don't leave that way my prayers won't save you it's got to be a decision of your own heart if you'd come and let us we'll show you from the scripture how you can get that settled for sure you need to come you come